In this conversation, I chat with Emma Doyle, the author of a new book called What Makes a Great Coach, Top 10 Practices of the World's Best Coaches. Emma is a tennis player, uh, international tennis coach from Australia. She is a speaker. Um, she's done a TEDx talk uh, that we'll link to in the show notes. Um, and then now an author. Like I said, she uh, just released this book recently. And we talk about several of the practices uh, in her book that make a great coach. And even if you're not a coach, there's, um, there's three things I really want you to get out of this that's going to apply to you uh, if you're trying to um, develop and improve your doubles game. So uh, the first thing is it's going to make your relationship with your current coach better. Um, she shares several questions and ideas and kind of strategies that you can use as the student to um, interact with the coach and to give them the information and the tools that they need to uh, get the most out of you as a tennis player. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two is um, it's going to help you find a good tennis coach. Uh, there's lots of questions, like I said, that she shares with us um, and things that you should be looking for in a good tennis coach. Uh, and then it will help you coach yourself as well as your uh, your partner. So it'll, it'll um, help your communication with your partner uh, and also think about your own game and what you need to do to uh, get the most out of your own abilities and your own kind of development process. So um, Emma has been studying this since 2016, and uh, she's got opinions from uh, Roger Federer, from Patrick Muradoglu, from Nick Boletari, uh, Gigi Fernandez, and a lot more. Um, so it's uh, a ton of knowledge kind of packed into one episode. So um, without further delay, uh, I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Emma Doyle. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Today we have Emma Doyle on. Emma is a tennis coach, a tennis player, a speaker, and now an author. Emma, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. Uh, we, we were just chatting a, a moment ago and we, I guess we met like five years ago or so um, and haven't seen each other since pre-COVID. And then I, I saw the other day on Twitter, you're releasing this new book. And uh, I knew it was going to be good. Uh, I haven't read through it yet, but I, I was able to read the the intro and the start to it and was definitely hooked and uh, and planning on uh, going through the rest of it here soon. Um, but you've got uh, this new book out, What Makes a Great Coach, forward by Judy Murray, testimonials from Nick Boletari, Gigi Fernandez, Emilia Sanchez, Patrick Muradoglu. It's um, it, it's wild the the amount of praise that it's gotten already. Um, and I want to go through all of this, but uh, tell us what um, kind of inspired the book. How did this kind of get started? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for that. I, I still sometimes pinch myself. You know, I'm just an ordinary person living an <laughs> extraordinary life and tennis being the vehicle. So so thank you for that. Um, I'm very humble uh, moment. So what happened was it was 2016 and it was the US Open and I was doing some work in Locust Valley on Long Island, helping a club with their summer camps, how to run summer camps, coaching their coaches. And uh, Roger Federer was playing in a pro-am and he literally was walking from the tennis courts back to the helicopter. And I was like, I think he's going to walk that way. I think I've got 30 seconds to ask him my guiding question, a question that's always just, I've always been inspired by, which is like, what makes a great coach? Like how, how can I become the best coach possible? I've mm -hmm. always, even as a player, how do I discover my inner coach as well? So that's important um, for all your sure. players who listen as well. And anyway, I said in one tour maximum of three words, what makes a great coach? And he said, someone who listens. And I thought, oh, I just wasn't expecting that. And mm -hmm. from that moment, I then started a podcast where I started asking the same, that question was my third question of every guest in one to a maximum of three words, what makes a great coach? So, you know, Will, you know, I'm going to ask you that. So I hope you're great <laughs> already ticking over to get to, uh, your responses soon. But basically uh, this inspired some amazing research and some, I started to get great data. I was, I kept asking anyone and everyone. And in the end, we had over 520 coaches of which seven, uh, 16 were tennis players and seven of those were former world number ones. 
And then the rest were, were coaches. 328 were tennis coaches, 105 business coaches, and 71 sports coaches from over 21 different sports. So that's mm-hmm. the background behind the research of which I'm still collecting. So I'm sure the, yeah. second, the second edition will be over 1,000 coaches. But um, for now, I had to cap it somewhere. And so that was really the inspiration behind uh, how, how the book got started. So it has been six, a six-year journey for me. So Yeah, awesome. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I, I think the last time I saw you was in, uh, I think it was in Vegas at the P- USPTA conference, mm-hmm. maybe. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember stopping by, I think I was on the way somewhere and I, I stopped by and listened to you speak for a few minutes during your presentation. And one of the things that you said, I, I think this is what it was from, but it may have been somewhere else and correct me if I'm wrong. But one of the things you said, uh, is it's not what you say, it's what they hear. Um, I'm sure you go over this in the book, but can you elaborate on what that means? And if there's more to the quote, go ahead and expand on it as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. Look at me. I I even know what page that's on. Okay. Uh, I remember that that stuck with me when I heard that. I was like, oh, that's so well said. And so, Um, you know, the coolest thing about, uh, about the book is how many people have impacted my life. So it is very... It is my personal journey as well about being becoming a coach and the mentors who've impacted my life. So a lot of people mm-hmm. may not he- have heard of this mentor, um, but Pete McCraw, who um, had a, a huge impact in my early, early days. So the quotes from him, he said on page 148, sorry, I'm just so <laughs> proud. <laughs> it just released, you can tell I'm so still so excited. He said, <laughs> effective coaching is not what you say, but what they hear, not what you show them, but what they see. Not what you do, but what they do. In the end, the value is in how we communicate. So they come back time and time again. And that's uh, practice number uh, nine, communication. Right. And I want to go over that one as well. But elaborate on what what that means to you. Like where where are coaches making mistakes with that? Or um, so, yeah, go on. Yeah. So basically, um, often when we start out as a young coach, we go to our default which is the way that we learn, the way that we like to communicate and Mm -hmm. the way that even maybe we played the game. If your style was all court, then you're very passionate about giving everybody an all court game style, which I'm not saying it's a bad thing. You can have your core philosophy, but one of the the biggest moments that I had with myself as a coach is when I realized that a great coach coaches in the way that the person in front of them learns. My biggest aha moment was when I could only relate to half my players. So if you were extrovert and kinesthetic, then I was a pretty good coach for you. But if Mm -hmm. you weren't those things, I really didn't understand how to bring out the best in you. So it it took me getting out of tennis and interestingly studying uh, under open door coaching, which is what I do now. I mainly coach coaches in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I work for this company teaching the Australian methodology of coaching, open door coaching. And I had to, I never forget when I got off court, I put my rackets away and I had to give a lesson where I wasn't, I was sorry, it was a a coaching session where I wasn't Mm -hmm. allowed to give one directive command. I mean, imagine being, you know, expert in, in angles of separation and and pronation and, you know, all the, all all this technique, I'm a subject matter expert. (laughs) I, I, you know, I know what I'm talking about. And I had to deliver, I wasn't allowed to give one direct command. I had to ask open questions and I had to keep peeling back the layers and I had to pull the information out of the player in front of me instead of pushing my map of the world is what we say as a, as a Mm -hmm. a linguistic programming coach, instead of pushing my map onto the player, I had to draw out what I, what, Sorry, see, that was an unforced error by me. <laughs> Not what I want for them, but what is best for them based on their motivations, needs, desires. That in Australia, we call it their developmental readiness. Sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. And is that that's something we can do for ourselves as well, I imagine? A hundred percent, because I think as players, if you think about from a player perspective, knowing why you're going to see a coach, knowing what you want in a coach, knowing what works best for you, how do you receive information best and share that information with the coach so that mm-hmm. they can increase their coaching toolkit to be able to to uh, to bring out the best in you because so often players just go to coaches and you know just say, tell me everything mm-hmm. you know. But one yeah. of the beauties of asking questions and and especially as it relates to doubles, 
um, which I know a lot of your audience is um, listening for the, the doubles tips, is being able to understand who your partner is. Mm-hmm. So being able to communicate in a way where if I understand my player, my partner's, my doubles partner's personality, it might be the difference between uh, just getting to the point and, you know, and saying things like we can do this, like really fast, short, sharp tactics, sure. or somebody might need that, that, that warm approach. And before the mm-hmm. match, you know, they want to like, if, if their dog had an operation last week, it's really important that you ask about how the dog is doing post operation yeah. before the match because that's important and i've got a, a free youtube clip if you just um, maybe we'll put it in the show notes but does your personality yeah. match your game style is a great yeah. way to understand your partner uh so that you can communicate effectively with them with yourself and with your coach awesome yeah we'll definitely find that and put it in the show notes um a a question came up for me that i wanted you to elaborate on from uh the intro of the book uh, you had a phrase in there called the curious champion mindset. Mm. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that means and why it's important. Yeah. So that's practice. Um, practice uh, eight in the book is curiosity. And notice we call them practice practices, not chapters. Yeah. It's not like, oh yeah, curious. I do that. Like tick the box. Yeah. Done. I do that, tick the box. Fixed it's it. A, <laughs> and it's not best practice. It's next practice. Mm-hmm. So it's a continual ev- evolution, um, such as listening, such as curiosity. So just my quick backstory on being curious. It's funny. I was, I've always been like a super curious kid, but then mm-hmm. as my, my coaching sort of developed, I stifled that because I didn't, I was, you know, had, I had a fear of looking stupid amongst many of my, my peers. Uh, like I was coaching at quite a high level, but I was still young. And so I didn't, mm-hmm. so I suppressed all my own questions in my head, like, just I wanted to know maybe you know about a pathway of development or something I was doing I didn't I want I didn't know if I was on the right track but I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be embarrassed in in case it was a right. stupid question in front of all, all my peers and and so that's something that but by, by me being, being vulnerable in that story I hope that other coaches and players take that what I just said and blow it out the window because curiosity is a coach's superpower and if you don't have a curious mindset, then you, A, you need to develop one. If, if, if you want to enjoy your tennis, tennis is a problem-solving game, which is what I talk about in my TEDx talk as well. And mm-hmm. it reveals your character under pressure. So the more curious that you can get, even about your the person on the other side of the net as you, if yeah. you are curious about when you hit that ball directly at their body down the middle, do they take forehand volley? Do they take backhand volley? Okay, get curious about them. Get curious about yourself. Get curious about your coach. Ask them questions and peel back the layers like an onion if you want mm-hmm. to become the best problem-solving tennis player that you can that you can be. And I'm talking about in practice, in a match, we can do that in between points as long as we, we mainly do it tactically. But we don't want to be too curious when we're actually in the moment of striking the ball, <laughs> of sure. course, if, we, if we're paralysis by analysis. Of, so, uh, but curiosity is one of the um, the mindset of a champion, of a champion coach. And again, if you're if you're wanting to discover your inner coach, did that did that resonate with you? Yeah, yeah, it did. And I think um, for me, I uh, I like to stay curious, like you said, during the points, probably not the best time, but uh, but between points a lot, and then also between games and between matches, right? And that's what I try to encourage our listeners to do is to constantly kind of be asking themselves questions. Okay, which yeah. player on the other side of the net is weaker? Do they prefer their forehand or backhand return? Do they prefer, prefer to be at the net or the baseline and so on? And then how can you kind of make them a little more uncomfortable um, and if you can maintain that, that curiosity, uh, then I feel like you can constantly be improving your strategy and your odds to win the match as well. Yeah. Um, and, and just on that note, uh, what I work with, with my doubles teams on the change events, they've got three things they work for, work through past, mm-hmm. present, future. So mm-hmm. just a quick, synop- you know, and, and Darren Cahill, uh, when I had him on my podcast, the mm-hmm. coaching podcast, he said that tennis is like a two-game sprint. You sprint for two games. So the past, what happened in the last two games, 
the present, what's the score, but take the emotion out of the score. So it might be 4-3 or 3-4 three, three, as an example. And now the future, who, what's happening in the next two games? What do we need to do? Either do better or keep doing, keep reinforcing. Mm. So I love that really simplicity of going through those, those three steps uh, on the change of ends and really um, and it's because it helps build practice 10 in the book, which is resilience. Uh, okay. So it helps build your resiliency because if you're curious, then you don't, you, you, you're ex, almost not excited, but le um, you learn from failure. It's almost like right. I'm curious to know if I had to play that player again, what would I do differently? Or if I had to play that team again, how could we adapt our, our game style to, mm -hmm. to, you know, to better expose their, their weaknesses, as you mentioned. And mm -hmm. so I think, uh, being able to bounce back resiliency time and time again, not just in the match, but also from week to week or season to season is another uh, another, another one of the reasons why it is in what makes a great coach. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it, curiosity also helps helps prevent anger potentially on the court. Um, if you stay curious, you can't really get mad. Uh, and... Um, like you said, there, there's just so many other benefits, yeah. but uh, I want to go through. Uh, oh, can I just say one more thing on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Maybe people might find this one interesting. Yeah. I was working with a client recently and they, they were really stuck and they were like, I just, I just can't, or, you know, I just don't know what to do. And I said, what if you were to go curious, go being a verb, just mm. if instead of like, like instead of trying to like, just work out what I was asking them, I was like, just go curious because mm -hmm. they were trying to get the answer right. And in tennis, you know, it's a game where perfection really doesn't exist. So, you know, I, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that one. If you're stuck, if you're ever thinking, God, what do, I, I don't know what to do with these opponents, just say, hey, what if we did, were to go curious mm. and just think outside the square? Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. Um, so let's step back. Tell us your tennis story. How did you get started in tennis? You grew up in Australia, right? Um, just tell yeah. people who, who uh, may not know you. Yeah, well, we sort of bounced back a little bit from the UK back and forward. And okay. so when I was growing up, I'm, I'm really one of those people that love sports, like all sports. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the UK, I remember, you know, just going around the neighborhood with a soccer ball and saying, I bet you can't kick the ball past me. It probably helped my volleys. <laughs> at the end of the day, but, you know, sort of rounders and anything like cricket in Australia. And actually I, I kick an AFL ball better than I play tennis, but I, girls weren't allowed to play AFL. We had to play netball back in okay. the day, which I couldn't stand because you couldn't run with the ball. So yeah. I really didn't like that. That sport didn't suit me, but anything with a bat and a ball or, you know, uh, anything with ball sports was, was my, um, and I was sort of sports captain of my school and um, et cetera. So, but as I was in the 12s, I wasn't really that good. So I started playing mm -hmm. tennis, not when we got back from the UK, I was, I was 10 and it, I really was introduced because my parents were playing squash and then they, they were getting too old for squash. So they, they started playing tennis. And so we just play as a family. So it started that way. So I started, I guess, quite late, I, you could say in, in today's terms, but I did have that mm -hmm. early multi-sport foundation, which I highly recommend to all parents, of course. And so mm -hmm. I had this beautiful relationship with tennis where I, I joined this club and it was the best thing that ever happened like this club wow I mean talk about an amazing atmosphere you could rock up you could hit with anyone you just play points yeah. um, some of my best friends today are still from that club Maribyrnong Park Tennis Club you know Chris Anstey went on to be an NBA basketballer uh, you know Joe Seriani played on the tour for many many years his ranking was uh -huh. up and down but he played um, you know all the grand slams, just an awesome person. And anyway, and this was that, in Australia. Uh, um, yeah, this was in, in Maranong Park Tennis Club in Australia. And one okay. of the girls' mums, she's sort of like, I don't know, like if you won the club champs, we went to a dinner dance and we used to do performances. And uh -huh. just the club atmosphere, I think, is something that is is not like it used to be. Um, so I'm really glad I grew up in that in that time. And it does take a special person to run a, to run a fat, like a real community based club, which I'm I'm a huge believer in. Uh, so I had a really great, great experience. And so I guess, and I was quite small. And then I started to get taller, fitter, stronger. And all the girls that smashed me in the 12s that by 16, they were sort of starting to maybe find other things, not, not tennis wasn't their chosen sport. So I sort of got better and better. But mm -hmm. I started coaching when I was 14. <clears throat> and I walked off the court and I was like, this is the greatest job in the world. How, <laughs> how could I become a coach? 
So when I got into sports coaching and administration, you'll hear the story in the book. It's one of the biggest turning points in my life. It was a, a famous footballer was our course coordinator at Deakin University. He pulls me into his office and I thought, oh God, what have, what have I done now? Because I was in high school, I was sometimes in the principal's office for, anyway, that's that's for another <laughs> podcast. Uh, but I, I basically, I was, I was in his office. I thought, oh God, what have I done? And he said, you know, do you want to become the best coach that you could be? And I was like, yes, like, what have I got to do? <laughs> and he said, have you maximized your playing potential? And I was 18 years of age and I was a boxer size instructor and I was fit and I was playing heaps of tennis and I was moving up like playing grade one pennant. And, uh, and he said, well, I said, this is thing called, like I said, absolutely not. I haven't maximized my potential. And I said, there's this thing called us college tennis. Like I've heard of it. I've no idea. I know a couple of people that have gone, I don't even know if I'm good enough. And I said, so I'm going to write away. And the first college that writes back to me, that's where I'm going to go. Like I'll just write. So I wrote to 10 (laughs) colleges that I knew other Australians. I put a VHS video in the mail, uh, yeah. Do you know what a VHS video is? Will? I, you, I do. No? I used to watch those. Okay. <laughs> I'm not. Okay. I'm not quite so, that young. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, uh, I, yeah. The, the, you know, this guy calls me and he says, you know, here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, we have a low crime rate. And I was like, Mom, what's a crime rate? <laughs> I didn't even know what a crime rate was. Rate was. So I'm. But um, also as it relates to doubles, I just want to go back to when I was, I was 13 or 14. Mm-hmm. I actually. Um, joined a, a pennant team uh, and I used to have to drive like 45 minutes on the other side of town and I got in a team with like five l- ladies like they're probably my they were probably my age now yeah. right but they were all really experienced players and pennant in Australia you play singles one week doubles the next week so two doubles okay. one singles match two doubles singles doubles singles doubles and I am so grateful, especially to this one woman, um, Gwen Waitman, her name is, and she's she's retired now. She she was a coach, a tennis coach as well. But she mm-hmm. taught me from 13 really what the meaning of the word doubles was. And I think more juniors need to play with older people to understand the craft yeah. of doubles. And that's yes. that that of course in, in college, my best results were in doubles. Um, mm. and so I, I had a beautiful, and I loved being a part of a team. I mean, yeah, being on a fun. team, being a part of a team, having six girls cheer for me. I just went to, I went, I went to visit uh, last month, my roommate in Canada and she's got, now got six kids, but anyway, that's again for another podcast, but, uh, <laughs> the, the camaraderie, you know, I love, I love that. And so that's my early, early sort of foundation. I'm so glad that I did that. Because every girl that I played in college, whether singles or doubles, I'd mm-hmm. be I'd be having this point with them, and I'd be like, "She's just as good as me. How am I how am I going to beat her? Whoever was mentally tougher, or whichever team was mentally tougher, was going to win." Because I couldn't. I'm like, her forehand's pretty good, her backhand's pretty good. She's got pretty solid volleys. I was like, "Oh God, what am I going right. to do?" And then I I used to you know really call upon my grit and say, "Well, who's prepared to stay out on this court one point longer, like one shot longer?" And uh, I'm so grateful. That just made me a better coach, especially at the highest level. I've represented Australia 20 times as a junior junior coach, mm-hmm. um, junior Fed Cups, junior world champs. Uh, and almost every single time it's come down to doubles. It's almost mm-hmm. always been one all in the singles and the doubles has been uh, one of the reasons why, especially I think as Australians, we, we can pride ourselves on on uh, having some pretty successful doubles doubles teams, and I think we we do teach it well. I think, you know, yeah. especially at the at the orange stage where kids fall in love with the shape of the court and they fall in love with transition. And I'm talking mm. about orange stage, not even just orange level players. I mean, I'm coaching a group of beginner women, and they're on orange stage. So yeah. uh, ladies, and they're loving it. They're loving coming forward because then you know if they get hit, doesn't doesn't hurt really, does it? Right. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, that's that's uh, a good point about the juniors. I, I feel like I still play some USTA like leagues and tournaments and stuff. And when I play in the um, the open draws, sometimes we'll come up against some juniors who are maybe 18 and going to play D1 or D2 or something. And uh, it, it hasn't happened recently because I haven't been playing as many tournaments. But in the past, I would I'd play these players who I I know for a fact if we played singles they'd beat me probably one and one in about an hour or less, uh, but we can hang in doubles and sometimes we'll win the match because they just don't know how to play doubles. Um, so it, I'm definitely a fan of 
the idea of getting juniors to play more doubles and understand it a lot better. Um, I think it would help their singles game as well, for yeah. sure. Well, Todd, Todd Woodbridge, I'm sure you, you'd know him. Uh, mm -hmm. He said that he used to play singles, so it would help him see spots on the doubles court. Mm -hmm. He could see gaps and see spaces on the doubles court by playing yeah. singles. Yeah, yeah, it goes both ways for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I want to go through, I picked out 10 of the, um, you said you called them exercises instead of chapters, is that right? Practice practices practices <laughs> exercises <laughs> thinking right. about school for some reason <laughs> uh I, I want i picked out five practices we've already gone through a few of them um mm -hmm. that i want to go through and give people kind of a preview uh so the first one is decision making so talk to mm -hmm. us a little bit about why that's important for uh, a great coach as well as you know this is important for people trying to coach themselves right so uh yeah. let's talk about decision making a little well the reason it's actually in practice one, because I mean, these are not in order. So over the 520 um, humans as part of the research, um, for mm -hmm. example, passion was number one in terms of what makes a great coach, right? Okay. So decision-making is not number one, but it's practice one. That is strategic. It is one of my core, core philosophies. As coaches, we still do not empower our players with enough decisions hmm. i'm even talking about the someone who walks in my door a beginner how can i empower them to make even two choices uh, do they want to hit it high or low do they want to hit it forehand or backhand do they, they want to hit it short or deep do they want hmm. to hit with top spin or slice uh, yeah. empower them with decision making and keep the decision simple to begin with for sure, sure. okay but the better you make a decision the better you will execute the shot. Your mind and your body is intrinsically connected. Make no mistake about it. And that's that's for the good and the bad, by the way. I've seen all sorts of psychosomatic stuff come up for players right before matches, you know, in terms yeah. of head headaches and, and stomach aches and and uh, by by the by the neurology of what they're saying to themselves. I feel under pressure. I'm so under pressure. All of a sudden they start getting this headache on the top of the head. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, you have to be able to understand that if your coach makes all of the decisions for you, if the ball lands here, you should hit it here, or you should always do this when the ball lands here. Mm -hmm. You want to train that within yourself so right. that when the ball comes, you're not thinking and you your body knows what to do, right? So you're training it to at, when you have first start, you do need to think, yes, I need to do whatever it is that's specific to you. Maybe it's sure. a cue word, but I'm I I do so much work with my my players, and I used to when I was coaching a lot more on court, with just having them call out loud. All those calling drills, rally, attack, mm, yeah. defend, um, you know, just calling between you and your partner is going to help your decision making. And if that is not built in, then when you go to close a deal on a big corporate uh, sales process, you're going to struggle. If you mm -hmm. don't have these decision-making skills, your parenting is going to struggle. You need to understand how you make decisions, how you best make decisions, and, and the person in front of you. So even if you're a parent and you've got kids, are you just telling them what to do, do this, do that, and, and doing everything for them? Or are you empowering them to say, hey, what do you need to pack in your racket bag today? What right. is going to be important today? And drawing that out, which comes back to, when I got out of tennis altogether and I did business coaching is when I really learned the value and the power of pulling those decisions out of people because it mm -hmm. helps them in life. And, and again, we, as we've mentioned already, this tennis, this tennis game is a problem solving game. We have to, we have to invite decisions around problem solving. Otherwise you will struggle under pressure unless your coach is there telling you what to do. And I don't know about you, but I'm not, yeah. I think maybe for one Grand Slam, we can have coaching, but the I'm, I'm a purist of the sport. I love yeah. the fact that you have to solve it for yourself. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That, um, that's interesting. So when you said, uh, if, you, if you're coaching a beginner, they come in and you, and you want to help them uh, or let them make decisions. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always thinking about like, especially with, you know, a lot of hot topic recently has been like pickleballs blowing up. Right. So, um, how can we grow the sport of tennis? And, you know, I, I'm focused on doubles a lot, but 
Um, when I watch coaches at, at clubs around here where I live and things like that, you know, they've got their set program and it's like they come in and like you said at the beginning, they're kind of making the player play on their map and they're not like drawing a map out of them. And I feel like um, if if they can come up with a, a framework for um, for making a few basic decisions at the beginning of each lesson or each clinic or something like that, not only will it help the player improve better, but it'll also get them more invested, I would think, right? Like if it's um, even like the parenting advice, like you said, if it's the kid's decision, the kid's going to be more likely to do it versus if if you're just telling them what to do. And um, I, I think that could be really important for just growing tennis, right? Mm. If these coaches can start to allow their students to to make decisions, then they'll be more on board with the, the lesson itself. Correct. And you hit the nail on the head. I mean, everything you just said there sings to my, my coaching philosophy. Mm. And uh, you hit the nail on the head with regards to, we have to make the product of tennis fun. So mm. if I've got four brand new beginners, then I've got sponge balls and I, I'm putting them in the service boxes saying, right, just show me what you got. I'm not, I'm not saying this is how you hold a racket. I'm not yeah. starting with, here's, here's your unit turn that I all want you to follow <laughs> because you don't yeah. have it beforehand. I mean, right. I'm sorry, but with a sponge ball in the equivalent of the kitchen, right, mm -hmm. is just good coaching. Just stick sure. them as close to the net as possible. Take away the net if you need to. Sometimes I do my warm-up like more with a cardio style where they're, where they're facing each other without even a net between the two people. Yeah. With a sponge ball, just saying, hey, tap it back and forward to each other. Show, show me what you can do. It's amazing how um, some people have come from another sport or they're, they're, they can tap into their athleticism. But, you know, no matter what I'm working on, I always give the players a chance. Show me what you've got first. Mm -hmm. Now let's maybe work on something specific and help you in that area. But I'm going to allow you... I'm going to give you a challenge or a mission, as I, as I always like to call it. And mm -hmm. I'm going to let you explore the, the outcome of that challenge first to see if you can self-correct. I mean, that to me is any coach that can, can do that. That's brilliant coaching. You know, instead of teaching topspin, you someone trying to get someone to swing from low to high, then just stick them close to the net and drop the ball knee high. Yeah. Right? And ask, yeah. you know, see, I bet you, you know, see if you can get it over the net and, and maybe you do just tweak their grip slightly, but I, I think that to me, that is, that is the essence of, you know, rather than I, so many doubles, doubles teams are so, they're so um, over prescribed. The coach yeah. has said, oh, we've got to play one up, one back, or there's all these unspoken. I hear it all the time. Yeah. All yeah. the time. And I just, honestly, if, if that is you and your partner, get curious about smashing all of those rules and throw them out the window yeah. and look at what, is going to be the best rules for you and your partner and design right. your own blueprint. Um, so I'm a big believer in that, uh, which relates to curiosity, which relates to decision-making. Yeah, uh, definitely. But coaches out there and and you yourself, if your coach, if you go to a coach is just telling you what to do the whole time, then under pressure, just check in, see, see how you're doing under pressure. Yeah, yeah, it's mm -hmm. going to be difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see a lot of, it, even some of the clinics that I do, like I'll go to these clinics just to hit balls and stuff. And I'm not, I'm not really looking for, for coaching because I, um, I mostly do just kind of coach myself um, as much as I can. But uh, yeah, you, you'll hear all these balls. Oh yeah, when the, uh, when the ball is here, you have to go down the line. And I'm like, well, not necessarily. Like what if it's this player's here and this player's here? It's like, it depends. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there are, is a lot of kind of over prescribing, like you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next thing, uh, or the next practice is, uh, number three purpose. Let's mm -hmm. go over that one. What does that mean? And how should people think about that? Yeah, well, I think it's super important because it's directly linked to motivation. Mm -hmm. So if you know what, if you do know what your purpose is, so just for example, why are you doing what you are doing or why do you go to coaching or why are you playing tennis? Mm -hmm. if, if that rudder is, is if you have an intention and a mission and something that's greater than yourself, then working hard is easy. Training becomes enjoyable. Practicing with your partner will become a joy. If you mm. have just a, a, a higher purpose, if you're doing it, yes, for yourself, you might want to improve or you might want to 
um, help with your fitness level or your health. But if you've got something a little bit greater than, than just you, so it's you and your doubles team or it's you and, and the overall team, then your, your enjoyment of the sport will grow to a deeper level. And mm-hmm. so having a purpose is so important. Now let's look at training. If you and your partner are training together and you have an intention for that session, just one intention, maybe it's to, to um, enhance your communication together. By having a purpose, you can then reflect on it. Hey, how did we go with that? Or check in halfway. How are we doing with our, with our purpose for this session? And as coaches, in everything we do, there must be an underlying purpose. If you don't have a purpose or you're just doing the same prescribed program and that's not specific to the people who are in front of you, then you're going to just go through the motions and you're going to get burnt out with coaching pretty quick. Yeah. So having an intention, having a purpose helps with motivation on all levels. Is there, in this scenario, is there a difference between purpose and goals or are they kind of interconnected? Talk, talk about that a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, and I don't think I really have a, a specific answer for you there. I think you, you'll laugh at this one. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> so it depends on your personality. If you need someone who needs a specific goal, um, mm-hmm. If you're more of an auditory digital or, or my personality profiles, if you're the aggressive baseline of personality, you're going to need a goal. You're sure. going to need to, you're going to need to drive that goal. And if if you're the the consistent player personality, it's really cool when you team up with an aggressive baseliner because they're going to probably pull you along with their goals as well. Yeah. But if you have an overarching purpose together, um, mm-hmm. like an I think of an umbrella. And the mm-hmm. little arms of the umbrella are your own individual goals, but you've got an overarching purpose together. Then I think that'll be again, it, it'll help you just with your own, uh, with your own little map of the world and your own direction. It'll help you sure. get to where you. It'll help you get to where you want to go faster. And yeah. I'm definitely into accelerated learning, accelerated growth. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm cu- super curious around how can I pick up things quicker. Yeah. So that would be that would be one way. So check in with your own personality to to know what type of goal you need to set and whether you need a purpose on top of that as well. Yeah, that makes sense. What what uh, one thing that came to mind for me was when I had uh, Luke Jensen on the podcast, he talked about um, I asked him about practice when he was on tour, and he said he would go out there and have his checklist. He'd have to hit. 100 serves in the deuce court, 100 serves in the ad court, 50 returns uh, forehand, 50 backhand, and so on. And then he said his brother Murphy would just go out and hit balls and kind of feel things out. And then once he felt good, he was good, you know, yeah. and, and that yeah. drove him crazy. But yeah. Murphy, you know, Luke's approach drove Murphy crazy. So each one worked for themselves, for, for each other. And, exactly. uh, and yeah, yeah, it really is going to depend if you're, I guess, goal oriented or not. Yeah. So, uh, so on that, again, check out that, that video to understand your partner. Okay. And uh, also uh, I was going to say, uh, it just escaped me, but something along the lines of, you know, it's not one size fits all. Oh, that was it. Make sure yeah. you ask your, <laughs> ask your partner what mm-hmm. they need, especially before a match. Yeah, everyone's so absorbed in themselves before a match, and even mm-hmm. in a warm up, they're so focused on themselves. So I think if you can know and ask your partner, "Hey, how do you like to warm up, and what do you like to do right before a match? Do you need to be mm-hmm. by yourself? Do you need to you want to listen to music? Do you need to do you need me to be around me and and energy? And then think mm-hmm. about what you need and see if you can find a balance. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's one, good. One of my, one of my other doubles drills that I do all the time with all of my players, I call it the hot spot. So mm-hmm. just basically in the center of the court that you meet in the middle of the court to, for, for plans between points. Um, Cause otherwise it's always usually one player walking over to the other player, you know, and, or the other player always walking over or they just, they, you know, they just change sides like that and they don't talk at all. But I, yeah. I love that, you know, meet me in the middle. <laughs> So exactly. I, that, that's an apology. I, I do have a husky voice as well. I am not a singer. <laughs> I just couldn't help myself that, that, what, that, I forget who sings that, but I love that. I don't, song. I don't know you either, but I like it that in. song. It's a good song. <laughs> you should throw it in the middle of the podcast. Just we to, will. Where I sung. Maybe it's going to be the intro for this episode. Yes. I think. <laughs> 
love it. Love um, it. Yeah, that, that's true though. When I was, uh, I was just at the U S open last week and the, mm -hmm. the doubles, the pro doubles teams, you know, they always meet, um, usually the, the server will go to where they're about to serve. And then the, the partner will go to kind of right in front of that baseline mm -hmm. area and they'll chat a little bit. And sometimes the, the net player is standing in front of the baseline and sometimes they're just staring at the net and listening over their shoulder, like, okay, I'm going to serve wide and, and we're going to do I, and you're going to go right. Um, but sometimes, and I notice it more on kind of pressure points or in kind of tighter matches, they'll actually face each other, talk to each other mm. um, and kind of problem solve a little bit. Um, so that's, that's definitely a big, big thing um, as well. And the last one I wanted to ask about was, uh, we've talked about this a lot already, but, uh, communication. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you have a specific question around it or cause I could go in any direction, <laughs> uh, go in any direction you want. Okay. What do you think would ahead. be most helpful? So keeping okay, in mind that, that these are doubles players who yeah. are looking to improve their, their doubles games. All right, so let me just go to the section in the book, which is um, super useful, uh, and that is page 144, and change your communication based on learning styles. So there mm -hmm. are four types of learning styles. People learn best, obviously, visual preference. So players with that visual preference, um, they, they, they need to be shown the demonstration. Okay? Mm -hmm. They need to see it. They need to see how the pattern works. Uh, auditory, they're going to prefer to hear the verbal cues, um, the sounds. Um, it could be something as simple as when you hear this sound off somebody's racket, it's a good time to poach. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously some of them into uh, crossover as well. Um, sure. The third one is kinesthetic. So those players that do not want you to stand there and tell your war stories about when you played doubles <laughs> in 1960, whatever. Uh, they want you to just, they want to get on with it and they're going to want to feel things, um, mm -hmm. like it grip or it might be just um, certain things that you can do there. Uh, and then the last one, which not as many people know about is called auditory digital. So um, some players learn best when uh, things make sense to them first. There is a clear purpose, structure and process that is backed up by facts and figures. Hmm. So when you come across somebody like that and maybe people listening might be going, Oh, that is so my doubles partner. They're <laughs> in love with the statistics. So know what works best for your partner, know what works best for you and let your coach know, Hey, I read Emma's book. I'm thinking this is how I learn best. Yes. We're a combination of all four and a great coach will cover those four bases. Mm -hmm. But if you are taking um, a little bit more individualized instruction I think a coach who can adapt that information in a way, if it's visual, showing showing the footage of great doubles teams and showing how to how to move, it's it's why I I always have my whiteboard with me. I'll always just get that pen out and and draw, you know, in a group so that people can see it, they can hear it, and then, yeah. then they can watch it, and then they can understand the process. People need people like to know where they're going. You know, mm -hmm. this is today. This is what this is where we're heading in this in this um in this environment today and then allowing for the adaptability within that. But as long as you give them the structure, they'll, they'll run over hot coals for you. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's, that is something that's, that's really dear to my heart. And there's, you know, there's some conflicting um, research around it, but I threw it in the book because you know what, it's, it's my book. So I get to say yeah. what, I, what has worked for me. I've been coaching since I was 14 and I'll never stop you know, you said at the start, I'm a tennis coach. Well, most of my work now is actually in, in keynote speaking and corporate coaching. Mm -hmm. I will never stop being a tennis coach. Like I yeah. still, I can't help myself. And you should, one of my clients, like I have a four-year-old, I have a group of beginner ladies, and then I have a, you know, sort of a more advanced player. Like I just, I love the, I love the fact that I'll, I'll just, it's in my blood. I, I never want to stop that, um, being being in me because it constantly challenges the way that I that I coach, not just on the court but off the court. So anyone listening as well, if you're dealing with your your children, if you have have to, if you a lot of people I'm assuming are going to have um, have full time jobs as well as playing doubles. A lot of your <laughs> right. listeners, right? So yeah. this information is critical if you want to be able to bring out the best in your in your workmates, your mm -hmm. teammates. And how do you adapt your, your emails? 
you know, mm -hmm. are your emails just always direct and to the point because that's just who you are and you're not going to change for anyone? Well, then mm -hmm. you're only going to relate to a small percentage of the population. Right. So yeah, you're trying important. to get everyone else to to kind yeah. of fit yeah. your mold. That's right. So it's important to to reflect, look in the mirror, ask yourself constantly uh, what works for me. I have a blueprint every season um, when I when I worked at a, a large club. All mm -hmm. my my league ladies filled out their own blueprint. So it was a blueprint of before a match. I I like humor relaxes me or humor makes me want to punch me in the face. It was, it was <laughs> kind of funny sort of, you know, it was all these things. What, you know, how I like to be um, taught, how I like to be communicated with this is what I like before the match. This is what I like after the match. And, you know, and then I want to go out and have a few drinks with everybody or what it like, just that building that team spirit mm -hmm. is, is super important. It's um, and, and maybe one more thing on, on communication. If, if we have time, are you good? Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the junior Fed Cup team I took away in 2018, it's a really cool mm -hmm. success story because I had three completely different personalities, right? So one was from far north Queensland. She was like super laid back. Then the next one was sort of half Russian, half Australian. She was like, divide, divide, come on. You know, she was like really intense. <laughs> and then the other one was, you know, she had a very skilled tennis player. And so she could win the first set six love and then the next set was love six. And then, and then in the third set, who knows? So I had to be very, my communication had to be very, very streamlined. But one of the things that we did is we did our values as part of a team first and our mm -hmm. values drove our behavior. So we were the incredible raging elephants, which stood for uh, improvement, respect and enjoyment. And we used those values. They weren't just words, but they, the behaviors were linked directly off each of those words. Um, mm -hmm. For example, and I, this is maybe something really interesting for your doubles listeners, uh, we had something called the PNO, which was our potential next opponent. We didn't always know when we were in a knockout stage. We didn't know who our next opponent was. But sure. we, rather than not wanting to look at the draw, a lot of players, I don't want, I don't want to look at the draw. I only look yeah. at one match at a time. Right. I think that's um, setting yourself up for failure myself. Yeah. Yes, we're always expecting to win. And no, you shouldn't focus on the win. But, for example, our PNO, potential next opponent, we would go and scout them out so that we were ready just in case we had to play either team. So that's an example of the behaviors that were set from the values. So at the end of the day, as the coach, I didn't have to say, well, why didn't we do this today? And how come we didn't scout? I just say, well, hey, um, who wants to talk about our behavior, uh, sorry, our value of improvement? You know, did we mm -hmm. live that today? And can we can we show examples of how we live that today? And that was one of the reasons I think why we were so successful was the ability to, to adapt communication. And it was our ability to live by our values as a team. I think that is something league tennis needs to do more of to connect people together and it comes back mm -hmm. to purpose. Practice three, having that higher purpose where we're, we've got a, a little mantra that we're working towards. Uh, it's, yeah. It works in corporate, it works in teams, it works in, uh, in leagues, doubles leagues, mixed leagues, men, women, um, all, all genders. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, that's a good story. Um, yeah, I, I think there's like a, uh, my dogs are barking. <laughs> I, I think there's like an overarching theme for me here that I'm hearing where, um, where you're not, you're constantly not prescribing information to people and, and you're constantly kind of drawing things out of people and that gets people bought in more. And even if like you're the coach and they're the players, really together you're you're kind of almost equals and you're you're kind of a team and you're just kind of providing a framework for um to kind of get the best out of the team uh and not necessarily telling everyone what to do all the time i, um, I, I love saying my definition of coaching it's helping them learn rather than teaching them yeah you know and i and sometimes i'm not saying we don't have to teach there are there are moments where we need to teach so please yeah, don't yeah. get me wrong There's i'm not balance. saying you know, it, it is a balance, but mm -hmm. most of the time I just see teaching pros teaching all the time. Right. And I don't see enough of the other side. And and I know it's messy at the start. It looks messy. That kind of coaching looks messy. But if you trust it and you train it, it yeah. actually, you, you said it, it sticks because there's more buy-in and mm -hmm. you'll, perform, you'll perform with pressure, not under pressure. You won't be mm -hmm. under pressure. You'll perform with pressure moment and moment and time and time again 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 and you'll build that resiliency muscle where you'll be so hard to beat 
rather than focusing on winning, you'll just become a winning machine. It's so mm-hmm. it's, it's beautifully ironic, but uh, but it's one of my favorite things to to see in the development of people. Awesome. Well, yeah, we could go on and on about this. Um, I have a few last kind of rapid fire questions, and then we'll hop off in a couple minutes. Um, what is your favorite tennis book other than your own? <laughs> <laughs> What about my kids' book? We forgot to mention that one too. That's for, that's a fun one for two to six-year-olds. It's called What Do I Wear on My Feet to Play Tennis? The little character tries on a neck for a shoe and a cone for a shoe. and a, <laughs> That's awesome. A Dr. Seuss little inspired. If anyone's got any two to six-year-olds out there. Uh, okay, so I'm willing I, to that as well. Yeah. Uh, my t- In terms of tennis, uh, obviously, I'm sure people have said the inner game of tennis, but it, it is the one that had the biggest yeah. impact on my early coaching uh, mm-hmm. And it, and it hundred percent relates to the way that I coach and to see my book next to the inner game of tennis was like one of my proudest moments on Amazon yeah. uh, on that's the awesome. weekend. So, so that's a good one. Uh, and I, I like books that are uh, like who moved my cheese and the monk who sold his Ferrari and all those things that are not huh. tennis, but they could be tennis. So I like those types of books that, that help you think outside of the square. Great. What is your favorite uh, tennis tournament? The Australian Open. Australian Open. Mm-hmm. And last it's question. So accessible. For... So accessible. I yeah. highly recommend everyone get down to Melbourne. It's easy to get in. You don't have to queue for hours and hours. Obviously, Wimbledon is is my is a soft spot there as well. Yeah, yeah. Australian Open is great though. Mm-hmm. Um, last question. How do we make pro doubles more popular? Support it. Go along and support it. It's it's if we go and watch it and if we go and uh, be a part of it, then I think it'll, it'll get the kudos that it deserves. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, you know, there's some, there's some great characters. I think the role models are important. I think having, having, you know, like a Bethany Maddox Sands, you know, she's, yeah, yeah, she's out there and, and I I like the way that she commentates and she, she sees the court. And uh, so you know, if, if there's a role model who will follow, follow them and support them uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, it's not easy on, on the doubles circuit, but, you know, like uh, I took John Pierce away when he was, um, he was the, in the, uh, was the 12 and under Australian team. We, we played New Zealand and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you, you know, and you just, you, I don't know, sometimes the, the meeting those kids when they're so young and, and now look at him doing so well in, in the Grand Slam doubles. It's so yeah. awesome to see that. Uh, so uh, know who your like know who your country uh, players are as well. So yeah, follow that's the, a big one. Know, yeah, follow yeah, the, your country so then you can um, get behind them and uh, and it and it and at the end of the day, what does it come down to? It comes down to doubles. You said how are we going to grow the sport? Doubles is fun. Right? Yeah, it's what everybody plays. <laughs> and 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 it's what everyone plays, and it's also. Make it make it easy, coaches out there. Don't please don't just you know make everyone serve and volley if they if they if that's not what's yeah. going to help them fall in love with the sport. Yes, you can teach them that down the road, but uh, always look at who's in front of you and give them the best possible experience. Absolutely, mm. awesome, Emma. Well, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm sure we'll do a round two at some point. But uh, everyone listening, we'll link to everything in the show notes um, and definitely check out Emma's book. Uh, or both books if you have kids as well. Um, but anyways, thank you, Emma, again for uh, coming on. Uh, I, I appreciate you, Will. I, I know what it takes to put a podcast on. So uh, kudos to you. It's not easy, but um, sharing information is another way that we continue to grow the sport. So thank you for making me a better coach today. If you want to become a smarter doubles player and start winning more matches, then join the Tennis Tribe Double Strategy Newsletter. Every single Thursday, I'll send you a new doubles tip or tactic that you can use in your very next match. And when you join, you're going to get a free guide on how to play with more confidence and start dominating at the net in doubles. My name's Will. I'm the founder of the Tennis Tribe. And over the last five years, I've worked with players at every level of the game, from USTA 3-0 players all the way to Division I college programs, as well as some of the top 10 doubles players in the world. And on Thursdays with this strategy newsletter, I share that knowledge and advice that I've gained over the years with you. So to sign up, you can go to thetennistribe.com. And again, you'll get that free net play guide when you join.